Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Uh, my name is Stephanie Huang. I'm the Development Program Associate here at the Korea Society. So I'm really excited for all of you to hear from our really great panel of speakers tonight about their career journeys and insights. Um, this program is a part of our Young Professionals Network series, or YPN, here at the Korea Society, and is in collaboration with the Asian American Bar Association of New York, otherwise known as ABNY. Um, our panelists tonight include Karen Kim, Senior Counsel at QBE North America and current President of ABNY, Judge Judy Kim, Acting Justice of the Supreme Court, New York State Supreme Court, New York County, Brian Song, Litigation Partner at Baker Hostetler, and our moderator is Dami Park, Director of Business and Legal Affairs at Concord Music Group. So I'm going to turn it over to Dami to kick us off. Just everyone, please join me in welcoming all of our speakers. Hello. Um, <laughs> okay. Thanks, Stephanie, for the introduction. Um, it's a pleasure to accompany a wonderful group of uh, professionals who represent our industry very well. Uh, my name is Dami Park. I um, will be your moderator today. And as you will hear, our panelists have diverse backgrounds and career trajectories. Uh, collectively, they represent not only a broad range of practice areas, but different sectors like public and uh, private litigation and transactional law, law firm and um, in-house, as well as judiciary, the top of the food chain. <laughs> um, um, so I hope our audience can hear their perspectives in many different angles. Before we begin, let me check our audience uh, demographics. Please raise, raise your hands if you are a lawyer. Okay, uh, law students, um, non-legal industry professionals, okay, and others who are thinking of going to law school. Great, great, everyone's welcome. <laughs> um, so, let me turn to our panelists. Can each of you please introduce yourself and what you do? Okay. okay, so I'll begin. So first, I want to thank Korea Society for inviting us and all of you for coming on such a wonderful rainy day. <laughs> um, so my name is Karen Kim. I'm senior counsel at QBE North America. It's an insurance carrier and um, based and headquartered in Sydney, Australia. I'm part of the business unit support team within the legal department. So I support the program's business, loss control on a variety of legal regulatory compliance issues. So that could be drafting agreements, amendments, notices, also working within the business on filings team, audits. Um, it could be from reviewing underwriting guidelines to reviewing regulations so that the notices are in compliance, um, communications with the Department of Insurance. I also do trainings. It could be like non-disclosure agreements 101 to very specific insurance concerns like rebating. Um, so it's across the board. It's general business support on whatever comes up. And um, I've been at QBE for about three and a half years. So it's been interesting. Great. Hello, everyone. And I also want to thank the Korea Society for inviting me to speak tonight. Uh, my name is, as you heard, Judy Kim. Um, I'm sitting right now as an acting Supreme Court justice, which means that I'm actually an elected civil court judge since 2016. Um, and a few years ago, they designated me to sit in the higher court, which is the Supreme Court, our trial court here. It's unlike other states, the Supreme Court is actually the second trial court level, not the highest court. Ours is the Court of Appeals. Um, and I'm sitting now in what they call a general individual assignment part, but it's all civil matters, so I get a variety of contract work, commercial litigation work, um, torts, personal injury work, um, whatever really fits under the civil matters category. Um, and so that entails doing a lot of decision writing on motions, which are, for people who don't know, it's applications to the court for various relief. Um, and then I handle um, jury trials coming from any part. So you know, it can be a medical malpractice case. It can be an asbestos case. It's a trip and fall case, that sort of thing. Um, 
yeah, and that, that's wow. about what we do. <laughs> okay, great. And Brian? Good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Song. Um, I will also thank the Korea Society <laughs> for having us here. Um, I'm a partner in the law firm of Baker Hostetler. We're a thousand, law, a thousand lawyer law firm uh, with 17 offices across the country. Um, Baker Hostetler is a quote unquote big law uh, firm. Um, my practice is in litigation, uh, mostly commercial and on the civil side. I do a little bit of white collar. Uh, so there's sometimes some bleed over between uh, some of the practice areas that I do in securities litigations. There's often uh, not only a civil piece to that, there's a regulatory piece of that with the SEC, and then there's often a criminal piece uh, with DOJ as well. So that sometimes my practice area crosses over. Um, I, in my second job, uh, I'm an Army reservist. Uh, I, I began my career in the Army Judge Advocate General's Corps. Um, I left active duty in 2007 and have been in the reserves ever since. Um, I'm currently a defense counsel, a regional defense counsel, where I defend uh, soldiers who have been accused of uh, either violations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice or other violations that could potentially get them kicked out of the, uh, of the Army. Fascinating. Let's move on to hearing about your career journeys. Um, was there any critical stepping stone that led you to the next opportunity or just start? Can we go backwards? <laughs> yes. <laughs> sure. Uh, so as I said, I started, you know, I have a sort of non-traditional career path. So I started in the Army. I was a ROTC cadet in undergrad. That's how I paid for college. And I deferred my commitment to go to law school. Uh, I never planned on making the military my career. So I was going to do my four years and then uh, come out into private practice. Um, so that was probably the, the biggest transition point, right? It was leaving the military and coming to New York and, and working in private practice. Um, and one of the, I guess, early lessons that I had was using a network. And frankly, I used uh, a former president of Cologny yeah. who helped me uh, get my resume across to a you know, wide range of law firms. Mm -hmm. uh, and that helped me get a job here in New York. Um, so my career, you know, started, you know, as I said, non-traditionally, but I've been in big law and been in, big, in the practice of law on the civil side uh, since 2007. Uh, I've joined, been in a couple of law firms uh, since I came into private practice, but I've been at Baker now for uh, thir almost 13 years, which is a good, good chunk of my career, and, um, you know, have in, enjoyed my time in private practice. Great. So I guess, how far back do you want us to start? <laughs> because, you know, we have a law student. But um, I mean, just in terms of becoming a lawyer, I, you know, I started thinking about that in college. And, you know, quite frankly, I was thinking about becoming a doctor at that point also. Um, and so, but the thing, which may not have been the best way to decide it, but um, I essentially decided to go the pre-law way because I was doing better in those classes and, and than I was in sort of pre-med. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also tried to do uh, summer internships where I could, you know, and I worked at a hospital and I did some other stuff. So that, that's how I kind of came to law school, especially after college. I worked as a corporate paralegal at a big law firm, too, to try to help me decide that. Mm -hmm. Then I think once in law school, I really didn't think I wanted to do litigation at all, oh, frankly. Wow. <laughs> and uh, I had an experience where I worked in Korea at Kim and Jong after my first year of law school. Mm -hmm. And I was lucky enough to meet somebody who worked in the joint venture world. Mm -hmm. And Basically, that's you build up infrastructure in third world countries. And I thought, oh, this is this sounds great. Went back to law school, and it didn't really work out that way. You know that I would go into international law at a corporate firm, um, and so then I really just started. I kind of fell into litigation. I came back to New York because I went to law school in, at Tulane, which is in um, New Orleans, um, and. You know, I picked up admiralty law there, and I went after two summers there. I was offered the job, so I went to, um, I w no, one summer there, then I went right after law school and worked there. And, you know, I sort of just realized that, oh, okay, I actually think I do like this. You know, at first I thought I didn't want to just sit in front of a computer and write, read, and write all the time. Um, but then the, 
the more I started to go to court and, you know, I, I found that really, you know, something that I like to do. Um, so I basically stayed in different law firms in different fields for a while. And then at some point I decided I wanted to go into public service. Mm -hmm. And then I ended up at a job, which is not quite traditional public service work. It's an agency and we don't have to talk about that right now. But just for, in terms of becoming a judge, I never thought of becoming a judge. It's really interesting that even though as a lawyer I've been to court, you know, I, I just never had, it never occurred to me until I was at this agency and someone asked me, mm -hmm. have you ever thought about becoming a judge? I think you could be a good one. And mm -hmm. that's kind of how I ended up here. I figured out what you have to do and then became a judge, yeah. Emphasis. Um, so I also did not have a traditional path. So I knew I wanted to go to law school, but after college, I knew I didn't want to go straight to school. So I worked and did different things for about four years before I went to law school. And because I worked, I knew after law school, I wanted to work somewhere with like substantive work experience. So I went purposely to a very small firm, but I made sure it was like a diverse firm. So the firm was small, but it had a Dutch partner, a female a Chinese partner, African-American female partner. And so I wanted to get the substantive experience. So I was there for over a decade. So that's where I primarily worked. And I started in litigation. Then I did corporate, real estate, trademark, construction, uh, commercial real estate. And then eventually I did a lot of work representing architects and design professionals in construction law. And that's where it all accumulated into business law and supporting the business. So whatever came up with architects, it would be advertising, marketing, licensing, trademark, setting up your business, employment contracts, termination. And so that is how I built up my experience at the firm. And that's how I eventually came to QBE, which is insurance, but it's a lot of supporting the business. So that's how I came to QBE. Great. Now that we learned how you got there, um, let's rewind. Um, if we could go back in time, and if you could correct your mistakes or do redo the things that you've done in the past, what would that be? So for those who are thinking of going to law school or those who are in law school, what I like to say is, so I took four years off, right? So I didn't go straight. So I didn't really um, spend a lot of time with my co-students. And so looking back, I always recommend if you're in law school to really make connections with your peers because your peers will also advance with you. And they'll be judges and partners and CEOs. And that shouldn't be the reason why you do it. But you, know, you should have a support group and not just look at like mentors. But you can also co-mentor each other and support each other. So I wouldn't downplay your network amongst your peers. Um, and be I wasn't as active in law school, but you know if you can, try to fit in time to at least be active somewhere to build your support. Because it's never too early to build connections. I agree with that. Yeah, yeah I, something very similar in that. Uh, so I'm an introvert. And I would go and tell my introverted self back in law school, hey, you've got to go and network and learn and come to events like this, which I didn't do. Uh, so, <laughs> um, and, you know, being someone, first in my family to be a lawyer, I didn't have anyone that I knew that were, that were lawyers. I had no idea really what the legal industry looked like except for a very myopic view of what I saw in like law and order. Right? I didn't know what the legal industry was like. Uh, and so I had to learn you know, basically the hard way. I sort of stumbled into things. Um, you know, a lot of my early career was just sort of, oh, well, I'll do this and then you know, sort of figure it out along the way. Um, but I wish I had taken advantage of all the resources that were available to me to really learn about you know, all the different options that are available in, the, in this field. Hmm. Um, I think I would have told my old self, or if I had to give advice to myself, I would have said not to be so hung up on like the tracks that people follow. Like, are you going to go to big law? Are you going to do, you know, that sort of thing. And maybe had given myself more room to kind of explore other areas mm -hmm. and other jobs that you could have with a law degree. Mm -hmm. um, uh, because I think I felt that pressure, you know, like not knowing that there were so many other 
careers that you could have. Mm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, do you think hard skills or soft skills matter more in professional progression? If there's a, any hard or soft skill that really helped you stand out throughout your career, what would that be? So I'll go. <laughs> I think, especially if you, I mean, doesn't matter which industry you're in, I feel like people skills is critical in any industry. Um, building connections, being able to relate either to your clients, to your partners, to your fellow associates, or wherever you are, because you want to build that connection. And simultaneously with that, you really have to do good work and like be detail oriented, proactive, try to see how you can not just do the assignment, but how can you further advance and look out for issues for your clients. And so then you build goodwill and trust so that you become a trusted business partner or advisor. So I think both are equally important. Um, I think the more you work, the more you realize it really comes down to the people and who you work with and who your clients are. Um, someone said that their favorite and least favorite thing about being a lawyer is their clients, right? <laughs> <laughs> so I think being able to connect with your clients and just, you know, making, you don't have to, if you're not into sports, just finding something to just kind of be able to build that relationship. And I think that just comes with practice too. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you, you definitely have to work hard and, you know, do well at the job. There's no doubt, but you can't just do that, right? You have to, um, you have to have the people skills and, uh, you know, really just kind of be a well-rounded person. I think that, that, that's, you got to figure out how you can do that. Mm -hmm. You know, is that joining, you know, a bar association or, or some other activity or, cause really like if you're trying to go into the big law and you, at some point you're going to have to build, build a book of business, I guess, like you got to be able to do that. And that's not from just sitting at your desk and, you know, being the best legal writer or whatever. Um, so yeah, I think you definitely, definitely need both. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree in that, um, you know, you can be sort of the, the best technician and, you know, uh, you know, you can sight check and do all the things, but if you cannot make a connection with someone, you're not going to have a very long career. And, you know, talk about mistakes we made. I think, I think I had as a very junior associate that mentality of I'll just work really, really hard and concentrate on my work and, you know, I'll get the good grade, right? I'll get the recognition. And that's how I'll advance because that's how I always had advanced. Uh, that's not the way it works, right? Because the other associates who, you know, would go and, you know, spend time with the partners and, you know, bond over, you know, their favorite whiskeys or golf or whatever it would be, they had goodwill and they would then, if there was a mistake made, it's, it dampens that mistake because then they have that connection. Whereas if I made a mistake, <laughs> uh, not that I ever did, but if I made a mistake, it would be, it would be much bigger. Right. Right. Great point. Right. Um, given that all four of us are ethnic Koreans, I'm curious to hear whether your Korean, I, Korean American background has impacted you on a professional level. Um, I think, yes, it has. It definitely has. Um, you know, it's actually become more of, I think, more important now in the role I am than it did before. I think it plays a role now, too, in terms of advancing if I want to get elected to the higher position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it's definitely there, you know. Uh, yeah, that's what I'll say about that. Yeah, yeah. It, it's oftentimes we're we're the first or only, um, and which is still shocking in this day and age that we could still be first or only um, as a as a litigator. You know, there's not a lot of Asian litigators, never mind Korean litigators. Uh, it's just not what you know. When people see us, they don't view us as someone who 
should be an advocate or be in a courtroom. Um, they see us doing something else. And so there is that certain bias. Mm -hmm. um, as an army officer, that's the same thing. I was often the first or only. Um, and, you know, that's changed. Demographics have changed. But early in my career, certainly I would stand out uh, because I was the only uh, Asian or Korean face uh, in a room. All right, same. Even for me, I think I was the only Asian in the legal department until maybe two years ago. And so I just assume, you know, everyone has implicit bias, whether they recognize it or not. And so there is always that. Um, and I think it, as a cultural characteristic, Koreans and Korean Americans are very resilient. And um, being, you know, children of immigrants, it's also building a tough skin, not taking things personally, um, trying not to give up and um, not being as discouraged. I mean, it is hard, but I think being Korean American, I think even now more people are being proud of it, which is great. Um, and so now you could talk about, you know, Korean dramas. I have someone in my yeah. office who lives in the Midwest, he's Caucasian, and knows more about K-pop than I do. So. <laughs> yeah, I think I've had that So experience. it's a fun time, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, it's nice to be Koreans these days, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> where people actually, yeah. you know, know that that's, that's a country, you know what I mean? Right. When I, I remember when I was younger in, like, middle school, someone once asked me, who was a friend, you know, um, are you Chinese, are you mm -hmm. Japanese, and what are you? Mm -hmm. You know, and I still remember that today oh. because, you know, it was way before the 88 mm -hmm. Olympics where I think we kind of got on the map, you know. But, yeah, I mean, that's it's come a long way from there for sure. But we are still waiting for a lot of firsts. And, you know, I know I'm sort of answering a different question, but you brought up that, you know, there are very few Asian, let alone Korean, hello, oh, <laughs> Korean um, litigators. And now as a judge... I definitely see that too. And I've often wondered, like, why is that the case? And I kind of think it has to do also with our culture, you yeah. know? Um, because I don't even see that many Korean or really Asian litigants either. Mm -hmm. um, so it could be just that too. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I was born and raised in Korea. So the virtue of modesty and humility is deeply ingrained in me, <laughs> and it gets a little tricky um, at times. So, uh, okay, let's change gear. Because of the complexity of the work in our profession and the, the requirement of high rigor, um, our legal lawyers are often perceived to be a high stress job. Do you have any um, advice for striking a right balance? between work and life? It depends on the day. <laughs> but I do try to, it's hard. So like every day I try to like end my day so I can devote my time to my family. I have two boys. But then there's certain projects you're like, oh, I wish I said that or I wish I did this. And so it's a daily struggle, right? But I think um, if, you, if you've ever worked where you're overworked and you realize like in the end, Nothing really matters if it impacts your health. And so I'm very aware of how important health is. And so in the end, that's the most important thing. So I balance it out by just um, being having a grateful mindset, um, appreciating my family and trying to spend time with them, and then trying not to look at my phone um, during the weekend or at night, you know, as much as possible. And I set expectations. So if, if I get an email late, I will intentionally not respond till the next day because I don't want them to have this mindset like, oh, if I email this person, they're going to email me right away. And I want to be able to set those boundaries where I can. Mm -hmm. So even though I could respond, I will not respond <laughs> just to have that balance. So that's one thing I do. That's smart. I wish I had more in-house counsel. I do that. <laughs> um, it's it's hard. It's it, it. This is a hard career to have that kind of balance. Um, I think it's easier, a little easier for me now as a partner than it was as an associate, where demands on my time are, are a little less uh, to the whims of those above me. 
Um, so I, you know, much like Karen, I, I make sure I have time with my family. I have two girls. Um, and I make sure that, you know, we, we have our family time. Um, and also, you know, I need to make sure that I take time for myself, whether that's, you know, going to the gym, uh, and just decompressing, uh, and, you know, really understanding yourself. So like I mentioned before, I am an introvert. I go to these events. I'll, I'll certainly mingle with everyone at the end of this, uh, end of the panel, but then I need to go home and decompress. And I know that, <laughs> right? Because, uh, it takes, it takes something out of me. So, you know, you have to understand yourself and really, and probably for a long time, I didn't know that about myself. So you need to understand yourself. You need to understand when, what your you know, sort of personal limits are and when you need to, you know, have some, some me time. Right. I just really quick also like for work, I always ask, when is this due? Because everyone says it's critical and important and like a fire drill, but it never is. <laughs> so I always ask, like, when is this due? And it's important how you message it too. It's not, you're not as important, but I want to prioritize so I can get it done. And I think that also helps set the dialogue so everyone knows that we're all trying to work on this together. Um, and that also helps to minimize as much as possible the stress. Very helpful tips. Um, this is a fun one. I'd like to ask our panelists what their favorite law-themed movie or film is. <laughs> we kind of had the same one, so I'm going to start. <laughs> um, I, I actually uh, like uh, my cousin Vinny. I, you know, it still makes me laugh now. And I think actually the two that you're going to say were, were my top three, too, but I'll let you go. <laughs> Yeah, so we all like My Cousin Vinny. I don't know anyone who doesn't <laughs> like that movie. Um, a really old but classic but great movie is To Kill a Mockingbird. So if you've never read the book, uh, I highly recommend you read the book. If you've never seen the movie, I highly recommend you see the movie. They're both fantastic. And then um, more recently, I really enjoyed Extraordinary Attorney Wu on Netflix. So also very great also because it's a Korean series and the main character has is autistic. And so for me, I think that's fantastic because Korea as a country to recognize that and to have the main character have autism, I think is just speaks volumes of how much Korea has mm -hmm. developed and, and recognized. And the fact that they were an attorney, I thought was fantastic. So I really enjoyed those series. Yeah. So I'll, yeah, My Cousin Vinny is a classic movie. I learned, I actually, my instructor in law school, my trial advocacy instructor in law school, taught us trial advocacy through my cousin. <laughs> so what if you're thinking about becoming a litigator, you know, you can, you, you can learn all you need to know <laughs> just by watching my cousin Vinny. And then uh, obviously from my background, um, A Few Good Men is uh, a classic. Uh, that's kind of what I thought I'd be doing, playing a lot of softball and... <laughs> trying murder cases, but that just wasn't in the cards. I didn't watch My Cousin Vinny, but does it accurately represent the profession, you would think? Different it, aspects. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like yeah. going to a court in a different state and having the judge favor like local counsel, I think that's pretty... It's one of the yeah. few movies that talks about discovery uh, and yeah. uh, you know, certain, how to cross a witness and... It kind of like is making fun of the one of the lead uh, lawyers, you know, uh -huh. who's from New York and has a very heavy accent. Uh -huh. um, so it's also kind of like what you really shouldn't do, you know. But uh. <laughs> yeah. personally, in the drama Suits, I scoffed at the romance brewing between <laughs> Rachel and Mike while doing Discovery by Paper, which is incredibly slow and impractical. Um, the reality is you're probably sitting by yourself in a depressing room, clicking thousands, maybe millions of times um, doing e-discovery. So, um, Don't scare them. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's see. Um, I think we have some time to be a little more up close and personal. What is your biggest challenge and vulnerability? I know we touched a little bit about, about um, the Korean... Korean identity and that, but if there's anything that I missed earlier. Can I mesh that with the imposter syndrome? <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> All right, so we were, there's some questions that kind of mesh together. So one was, you know, imposter syndrome. 
And so, you know, I think everyone, if they're honest with themselves, has experienced it at one point, if, at least once in their life, I would say. And so for me, uh, when I was looking for a new job, you know, they have that classic story where, like, if there's 10 characteristics that they're looking for, the, you know, male Caucasian who checks off like four boxes and be like, I'm perfect for this role and they'll apply. And then, you know, stereotypically, you know, women won't apply unless they, you know, check off the majority. And so um, there's that stereotype, but, you know, kind of along those lines. So when I learned about the position at QBE, I immediately said, oh, no, I'm not going to apply because I don't have insurance specific experience and I'm the anomaly. Like 99% of the people that I work with they all worked at AIG, MetLife, like claims insurance, insurance defense. And so um, I initially didn't want to apply. And then I learned more about the position. I was like, oh, well, it's actually more business related. And it kind of does have transferable experience and skills. So I did apply. Um, but if I had not, I wouldn't have gotten the offer. So it's, you know, how do I overcome that? It's, it's the daily. It's not second guessing your experience. I mean, even at the law firm, I would tell my husband, I was like, you know, I do trademark applications, but it's, you can find out all the instructions online. Like you don't need an attorney, but you know, you do because it helps the process and you know what to do and what not to do. So it's not downplaying yourself, which I think is also ties to being Korean, Korean American and, you know, being modest. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is just daily practice of, you know, giving yourself more credit, giving yourself more grace, and then um, really advocating for yourself. Excellent point. Judge Kim? Oh, no. <laughs> I'll, I'll start. I'll yeah, go, go if you want. Um, so I'm a litigator, right? Um, there's a difference between being a litigator and a trial lawyer. Um, and so I struggle with, well, you know, what do I call myself, right? So I, I've been to trial. I've been to trial uh, a few times. I've had a couple jury trials under my belt. Uh, I don't feel like... I'm qualified to be a trial, call myself a trial lawyer. Um, and so that's something that, you know, in my experience, you know, does my experience amount to, you know, this, this qualification that is kind of ephemeral, right? There's no like definition for it. Um, I, I know people who have one trial and they say, yeah, I'm a trial lawyer. Now. <laughs> uh, so it's, it's something that I struggle with because I'm like, I don't know if I qualify as this or not. And, you know, going back to the humility, mm -hmm. like, you know, am I bragging or tr yeah. claiming something that doesn't, that shouldn't belong to me? Yeah. People don't understand that trial, that trial doesn't happen that often. Even if you're a civil litigator, like a couple times a year, if you're lucky, if, right? If you're extremely <laughs> because, busy, right. you'll have, you know, a trial a year. Right. Um, but yeah. It, Most of the cases settle, so... Um, yeah, the drama and films don't represent the reality. You don't have a new trial every week. That's yes. right. Um, maybe you might. Well, <laughs> yeah, like you might. Yeah, oh, of course. No, but um, I don't know about the imposter syndrome, but I think maybe it is the cultural thing too. But um, I do think that we sometimes, as Asian Americans or women too, we don't have the confidence to put ourselves out there and we do second guess that we are qualified for the position. So, you know, I think I definitely recognize that when I was considering whether to be a judge, you know, and, you know, to, to run for a judge, you need 10 years of practicing experience. Um, and I think I already had like about 13 or so, but by the time I actually got elected, I had 17, you know, years, but even at the time I was talking to someone about it and he said, you got to look at the application and start working on it now. Like look at what they're asking. And if you think you're lacking in something, start doing something. Right. So, but even then it was like a, it was, I spent a fair amount of time whether to apply or not. Mm -hmm. Cause I didn't think I was going to, I didn't think I had enough trial experience mm -hmm. or, you know, something. So we have to kind of get out of ourselves, our heads, especially I think women. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I can see that when people come 
before me in court, even if it's just for oral argument. Mm -hmm. I can see the difference between the confidence level and how people speak. Often, you know, more confidence from the male side mm -hmm. than the female side. So, yeah, I think I think we have to recognize that and and um, try to work on that. Interesting. Yeah. I do want to say so for those who are lawyers, and you know, even the judges say, "I never thought I'd be a judge." So. Um, even if you have like an inkling that you might want to be a judge and you're practicing, the application's online. So you should just pull it out, see what's on there. Because if you remember the bar application, like you have to list everywhere you lived, like it's just a lot. So like even if you don't know, you can like look at the application and start like maybe filling it out because it's a lot of information. And then, you know, later if you decide, then you did most of the application and you know, it doesn't hurt to prepare, and even if you think you'll never do it, you never know. So uh, we always need more AAPI judges. So if you have any inkling, I highly encourage you to just look at the application. Just wondering, um, among lawyers, um, raise your hands if you've been practicing law for less than a year, less than five years, 10 years, and more? Oh. Okay, so we have a lot of experienced judge candidates. <laughs> <laughs> um, I forgot to ask you earlier, Judge Kim, about your election process. Oh, right. Okay, yeah. so in, in and it's very specific to this county, mm -hmm. actually, so it's a little bit different even in our bordering other counties in the Bronx and Brooklyn, but in Manhattan, essentially you do have to be a registered Democrat because that's the political process here. There really is no other um, party that mm -hmm. has a process like this or even puts up candidates for judge. So you have to do that. And really it's two steps. One of it is the merit. And so you have to apply, you fill out a very extensive application and you have to go through the screening panel process which is arranged by the Manhattan County Democratic Party and uh, you submit to your application to them you have a subcommittee interview with maybe two or three people from the panel and then if you get reported out as highly qualified and there's a vacancy you can run for that seat um, the second piece of it is a political process where um, because civil court judges are elected by district leaders, you have to really get your name out there to those people, but also other people who are involved in the party. So the county leader himself, his, you know, his staff, I guess, but then also uh, different um, areas in Manhattan have different clubs. And each of those clubs have uh, district leaders, and then they also have executive members and you know other titled people who you know will influence mm -hmm. the, the race and the vote. So mm -hmm. there's that piece, and that can be a little time consuming, and you have to uh, commit to it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why I always say it's very doable, but you really need to sit make sure that you want to do this and you're going to commit the time, money, and effort to it. And you need the support of your family or your spouse or your significant other because it really takes a lot of time. Um, and so if you get reported out and you then there's a process by which you become the nominee for the Democratic mm -hmm. Party. Um, and then you get the seat, but some of the, the same seats are controlled differently. And so in the county, you get elected at basically a meeting of all the district leaders and usually it's by acclamation. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there can be a, you know, two candidates and so you actually take the vote and one person wins. But even then, um, you could also be subject to a primary race. Mm -hmm. So that usually doesn't happen to the county-wide seat, but to the district-controlled seat. And then two people will be petitioning. Wow. You have to get on the ballot, so you have to, when you see, actually it's going on right now, because there's five civil court seats right now, so you'll see people with clipboards carrying long green sheets with all their endorsed candidates, mm. including the president and, mm. you know, your Congress people and everything, and so you have a petitioning process, wow. and if both of you get on the ballot, then yes, then at the 
you know, by the time whoever wins the primary race will get the seat. And then you'll be on the November general election calendar. And then for Supreme, it's pretty much the same two things. There's a panel you have to get out of. Um, you do the same political process, but this time, not the district leaders, but what they call judicial delegates will vote for you at a convention in the summer. So it's very much like our US president. You go to the convention and all the different delegates vote for you. Um, so if you're the nominee, you generally will win the election in November because again, nobody writes somebody in, nobody has a candidate from a different party. Yeah, I usually look up the, the candidates on the ballot <laughs> right. when I was about to like, oh, who is this person? <laughs> Just check. So, um, right. so Judge Kim mentioned the screening panel. So if you have the opportunity to join a screening panel, I highly encourage it. I served on one. It is very time intensive, but it's very rewarding. It's insightful. It's good to have more diverse um, members of the screening panel and you learn more about the process, you appreciate judges and the process that they go through. Um, and you know the process is complicated, which is why I highly encourage everyone to join bar associations or support groups and they can help with you know guidance and you know suggestions as well. And I, I just did want to say also there's another way of becoming a judge. You can uh, if you're a family court or local criminal court level judge, you would be going through the mayor's advisory committee process. And it's a similar process where you have a subcommittee interview, full committee. Then you interview with, I think, the uh, mayor staff and then the mayor himself. And then you go through this whole process with the city bar. And then there's actually a public hearing at the end. And then if you get the appointment, that's it. You're not on a, that's that's the way you get the appointment. Um, if you want to be a housing court judge, that's also a different process, but <laughs> that's that's much more sort of administrative. It's, it's not a constitutional judge, and so it's run by um, the administration, basically, and it will have a committee of probably housing and landlord-tenant mm -hmm. lawyers and mm -hmm. some people from um, court, the court system, and they'll do the interview process, and then I think you also have to go through a public hearing at some point, and then you're appointed, yeah. And that is, that you you can apply to be a housing court judge after five years of be, okay. being admitted, um, and they, I believe, have a 10-year term. Civil court judges have a 10-year term, mm -hmm. and then Supreme Court judges have a 14-year term, right? And then anything above that in terms of appellate division and our highest court, the Court of Appeals, that would be the governor would mm -hmm. be selecting you. And you also would have to be, you know, go through the Senate nomination committee at the state level for those positions. Wow. <laughs> so simple, oh. right? <laughs> like, oh, it adds up, adds up, adds up. It's okay. <laughs> um, so you all have very accomplishing, fulfilling careers. Where do you see yourself in 10 years from now? I mean, I'm a little bit joking, but I mean, I think I could retire in 10 years, you know, I'm, but um, I don't know. I, I think I would just probably be in this same job, really, yeah. I'm going to, so uh, I actually really enjoy my job. I enjoy being part of the business. I enjoy helping and supporting the business, and it's varied and diverse, and I like that I learn a lot on a daily basis, and so... Hopefully, I'll still be doing this, um, maybe in different industry, who knows. And then I was half joking that I'm going to lament about my fact that my boys will be done with college <laughs> in 10 years, or maybe they'll be in college, but um, I enjoy what I do, so hopefully I get to continue to do it. Mm -hmm. Brian? Well, my girls will have graduated from college, <laughs> so that'll be nice. Um, you know, I... I wouldn't mind being uh, a federal judge. So that is sort of my one of my career goals. So in 10 years, Young, if you're still here, you can put down <laughs> um, either as a magistrate or as an Article Three judge. So that would be my 10-year goal. Great. Okay. Well, obviously, we could go on for hours, but um, let me ask the panelists our last question. If you were reborn, are you, would you choose <laughs> to become a lawyer again? Oh. <laughs> uh, well, reservation? <laughs> no, so I do enjoy what I do, but like ideal La La Land world, I would love to just be paid to travel and eat. Uh, right? Yeah. Like, yeah. To, I love 
trying different cuisines and food. I travel when I used to travel, it was to eat like different cuisines. And I would, you know, that would be my goals to, you know, so if I could get paid to do that, I would do that. But then I would still be a lawyer. (laughs) I would, I would choose to become a lawyer again too. And and maybe um, if I had known earlier, I would have tried to become a judge sooner too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I don't have any other skills that I could use, so I think I'm will be forced to be in the profession as well. Great. My my intention was to end with four resounding yeses. <laughs> okay. It is yes. <laughs> no, just joking. So this concludes our program tonight. Thanks everybody for joining us, and thanks again to Korea Society and Albany for hosting. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to turn it over to audience questions. We'll bring around a mic for anybody if you want to just raise your hand. Um, as, a, uh, as an Italian uh, immigrant, uh, my, uh, I was always interested in law but couldn't afford it at the time. So um, I just want to put out uh, some advice to the younger people here uh, uh, that I read somewhere in the New York Times uh, a while ago that in certain states, and I believe it was California, and I don't know if this is true in New York, but someone who doesn't go to law school, I believe it was a, um, it was a singer, a, a female singer that decided to change her career, and she went to clerk for a judge for, for I don't know how, many, how long, but she was able to get a, a law degree that way. And I was wondering if anyone could comment on that uh, as, a, as another way of getting into the field, because one of the obstacles I think today is the enormous money you have to put out to get in, you know, to pay for law school. And uh, so I was just, and as our distinguished uh, uh, male panel has pointed out, that uh, uh, the other way is, of course, going through ROTC, which, uh, you know, if you do join uh, the ROTC uh, while you're in college, um, they do pay for your law school. So that is an, another excellent way to, to get in, uh, which I wasn't aware of at the time. <laughs> so I was wondering if anybody would comment on that. I think that there's been some growth in public interest, of, like loan forgiveness program in the last 10, 15 years. I didn't personally benefit from it, but uh, there's that. If you could Google, and there, there should be some resource Right. I mean, there are other roles within, like, the courthouse. You can um, be a paralegal. I don't think, you know, you can get different avenues within the legal industry and not go to law school. Um, I was one of the many who went to law school with massive debt. So um, I have jokes. So in law school, for those in law school are considering, um, one thing I always say is I highly encourage you to squeeze in, like, a study abroad. So I did study abroad for both summers, and then I timed it with an internship program in the States. Um, That way you benefit from being able to travel because it's hard to travel. You get class credit, so you have one less exam. Um, But my my joke was, you know, I'm in so much debt, like, that's not going to really make any difference. But, like, if you can't afford it or if you, you know, are comfortable with debt, I encourage you to really maximize your law school experience because... That's the really only time you can like try out jobs with internships or externships or clerkships. But law school is extremely expensive. I completely agree with you. Um, I think people also think it's too long by a year. <laughs> so maybe that will change in the future. Um, but there are other legal careers within the industry, like working in the courthouse um, or working at firms in different capacities as well. Yeah. Any other questions? Hello. Thank you, everyone, for coming. It was really interesting. Um, You mentioned that there was a difference with uh, individuals who, with attorneys who present themselves in court um, in terms of confidence. Um, Can you describe some of the characteristics of an attorney who does not have confidence in court versus one who does? Sure. Um, It's like when you're giving the argument, you're presenting in a way with a lot of confidence. Um, And 
It may actually be completely wrong, but you can, <laughs> you can see that the person feels very confident about what he or she is saying, um, whereas the other person is not, and you know physically is presenting that way too, like in a softer voice or you know looking down, that sort of thing. I would say that, um, and I think this happens a lot. It doesn't really have to. Not it may not be the confidence level, but you know, you can't speak over each other, you know, and like you need to tell somebody to wait to to, to speak because you didn't cut them off or something. But like sort of those kind of interactions too. Hi, my name is Chungsa. I'm a two L at Brooklyn Law School. So my question is, how is mentorship if impacted your legal profession, whether that be having great mentors yourselves or now being in a position to mentor young attorneys and students? Well, I, I think it's very important, as I said before, like I, when I was a 2L, I didn't seek out mentors. So, you know, I, I made that mistake very early on. And uh, I learned from it because once you find people who are in the industry and can help guide you, um, you know, it, it, it makes a lot of difference. So now that I'm in a position to be a mentor, you know, I, you know, I'm able to provide perspective on career choices or what you should do. Or, you know, if you want to get to a certain place, how you can get there because I've seen it now. Um, and I didn't have that advantage um, when I was a law student, mainly by choice. Um, so it's, it is very important. And the fact that it, uh, organizations like Albany and Cologny have mentorship programs uh, that you can take advantage of, you know, you certainly should. Like, and you get out of it what you put into it. Like the, men, the mentees that uh, we have had successful relationships with are the ones that come to me with questions. They're not expecting me to call them and say, hey, how's it going? What's going on today? You know, you know what's on your schedule? They, they come to me with their, with their questions, concerns, or whatever. Um, the mentees that the relationships don't work are the ones that just sort of sit around and ex expect me to mm. you know, read their minds and, and figure out what's going on in their lives. I would also think of it more fluid, like you don't have to designate someone as like, you're my mentor, right? Or invite them, like, can you be my mentor? It's really your support group and who you talk to. And you can, you know, learn from your peers, people, you know, maybe in a completely different industry, different um, sector. But, you know, I would be more flexible, too, in mentors and how you can gain advice or insights from, you know, whoever you speak with. But I agree with Brian. You know, I think it is important. And the legal profession, as you'll find, is very small. And then the Asian community is smaller. And then the Korean American is small. So, like, we've known each other for quite a long time, but it's just because that's how small, you know, the community is. So the more people you know, the better, because, you know, they might learn of a position that's not yet posted or, you know, they may have some suggestions on introducing you to somebody. So it's a lot about building relationships. And I think it also goes both ways. You know, after all this time, I feel like I've had so many mentees. But, you know, it makes me really happy to see them succeed. And then sometimes, like, talking to them makes helps me, too. I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, that's really something I need to work on, too, right. that sort of thing. So... Yeah, if you can find one, try to find one. It can even be, as you said, like a friend, too, because sometimes you just need someone to kind of be your cheerleader and, you know, talk things through with. But I certainly think um, if you're lucky enough to have a mentor, you know, throughout your career, which I did not, um, until I said I wanted to become a judge, and then, you know, luckily I had a great mentor, and that person really walked me through everything I should do, but I always said, well, you know, I was like an A-plus student because I did everything <laughs> you said to do, and so, you know, but um, anyway. You were saving your lucks. <laughs> <laughs> so, you had a question? Yeah. Uh, during your career, you must have had a lot of decisions that you had to make. Uh, one question I want to ask is that among the various decisions you had to make, 
what was the thing that you thought was very important, but looking back, it actually didn't matter that much? Um, I'll start. So the ranking of the law firm, right? The where that law firm sits in, when you're applying for as a as a 2L for your summer and where you ultimately get accepted, like that doesn't matter. Like the rankings don't matter. You know, it because I thought much like, well, I'll I'll go to the best undergraduate school I can get into, and then the best law school I can get into, and then I'll join the best firm I can get to. Ultimately, what matters is your fit with wherever you're going to work. Like, and you've got to know, you know, again, some introspection. You got to know something about yourself and how that law firm operates uh, to know whether or not you fit there. Right. So it, the the ranking is is insignificant and unimportant for your career. Also, somewhat to answer your question, but not directly, is um, there's no career that's linear. And I think if you make a decision like, oh my gosh, I have to make this decision. I'm going to stay at this firm for like 10 years. Like life happens. And so I have a friend of mine who is like, I don't know if I should go here, but I'll tell myself I have three years. I'll stay at the company for firm or wherever for three years. And then it's more um, palatable, right? Then you could say, because not every decision is like your lifetime decision. And a lot of people pivot or change. And so I think when you make a decision, it's not, this is like the decision for like the next, you know, decade of my life, but this is what's good for me now. And then wherever you go, try to maximize and, you know, gain as much experience as you can when you're there. Yeah, I think it's sort of what I was saying before is that, you know, you, you're on a track all the time. Like you go to really good high schools, colleges, it never kind of stops, you know? And then at some point, I think I thought I really had to go to a law firm, you know, like I wasn't going to be successful if I didn't go to a law firm <laughs> and, and make, you know, make some money, I guess, or whatever. But um, yeah, I don't think that really matters. I mean, obviously, you have to have to be able to make a living, you know, and if you have law school debt, you know, I met several lawyers who knew by the time they their fifth year, they would be done paying off their loan, and that's when they really want to leave the big firm, <laughs> which they do call golden cuffs, right? Because you make a lot of money, and it's sort of a can be a sexy job, I guess. But you know, you're there all the time, you know, and you really can't have much of a life, really. But um, you know, I think sometimes it's hard to step out of that, and, and you know, if you find, which is easy to say now, but because that's what I found, but. If you find the job that you love, that's the job you should stay in, you know, because then it doesn't really feel like you're working, you know. And so if you find yourself doing something at midnight or 10 o'clock, it's not going to feel like work and you won't be so <laughs> miserable, I guess. But yeah, so that's that's what I would say. Like, right. I thought it really mattered. I have to, like if I'm going to be successful, yeah. I have to do X, not this, mm -hmm. you know. Or like care what society deems as successful, right? Or as a Korean American, like what the society thinks is like successful or what's important, like in the end, it's your life. And so it's, you know, what's important to you. Second that. Well, thank you for this wonderful and informative session. So I'm not in the field of law at all, but my question is, um, you all said um, being Korean American is quite important, right? And I think that practicing law is very specific to each country. However, have you ever um, had an experience getting involved with law in Korea, practicing law in Korea, maybe international law, maybe crossing over different countries practicing law? Um, another question is, do you think it's easy to change the law? If you see some problem, you, you have to abide by the law, but if the law itself is problematic, because I, I'm in academic, academia, so basically what I teach in my you know, students in art history is if something does not work, you have to work towards changing that. But as a lawyer, that's something that I would expect to be very challenging. So it's two questions combined. How do you cross over different countries, which has different laws? Have you ever experienced with that? Specifically Korea, and then changing the law. So before law school, I lived in Korea, and I worked at Taepyongyang or Bae Kim and Lee. 
Um, I'm their longest ever intern because I was an intern before law school. <laughs> so Korea is very different. It's black letter law. It's, um, it's not like the U.S. And so I, didn't, I, I wasn't practicing because I wasn't in law school yet. But even as an intern, I could see it's, it's just a very different legal environment. Um, as far as switching, I mean, changing the law is a long, um, ambitious process that takes a very long time. So even making small edits can take years. So I think um, while all of us wish we could change the law or certain judges who interpret them, <laughs> like, it, it is a long, um, slow process. Um, I actually I do have a couple of cases that in, in are international uh, involving Korean companies. Uh, I don't practice in Korea. These are this U.S. lawsuits involving Korean companies, so it's very different. Um, even the Korean privacy statutes are very very different, uh, and it makes litigation difficult because they won't tell you people's names, mm -hmm. <laughs> which it's uh, kind of hard to litigate when you can't find out. <laughs> You know what the witness's name is, uh, so I'm learning a little bit more about Korean law that way. Um, but yeah, I, I do have some crossover. Um, and then, yeah, to Karen's point, yeah, changing the law. I mean, the judge can you know, change some laws from time to time, uh, but it is a it is a very hard process. I mean, I think mo more of your question is for an advocate, right? Like, I guess if you see something wrong and you want to change it, and you can do that as a lawyer, but you can also, obviously, you would be in the other branch of government as a legislature to, you know, implement laws or changes to the laws. I mean, can a judge change the law? Only if there is some kind of discretion in there with the result. You can apply the law in a way that you think is the right way to apply, and it could come out and maybe two different ways, but I mean, I'm not changing the law unless I'm at the appellate division, you know, and then that's, then if I'm reversing something or, you know, then that sort of happens or obviously if you're at the court of appeals and that's the law of the land, right? So you can have more impact that way if you're at an appellate division level. Right, and there's yeah. also days like lobby day that like bar associations organize where attorneys go to the government, speak with officials to, you know, try to make their case. But um, we do this on a volunteer basis, but we also recognize that it's a long process. What was the second half of your question? Was that? That was the oh, second that half. that was the second, okay. Yeah. But for those who are interested, there are attorneys who do work in South Korea and other countries as expat lawyers. So um, it's a different title. You work only in English, and you do international arbitration or very specific. And then Korea is opened up, right? So you can now do more partnerships, but it's it's still relatively new. Great. I'm, I'm going to close out our program here, but there will be an opportunity for you all to hang out afterwards. So I just want to thank you all again for joining us tonight and for asking really great questions. And thank you so much to all of our speakers for joining us tonight. Um, I want to let you know that the Korea Society, if any of you are new or interested in joining our membership program or are curious about our Young Professionals Network or organization in general, I'll be around post-program and I'm happy to answer any questions. And now we're going to end our program with an opportunity to chat with our speakers and fellow audience members. So there are snacks and refreshments in the back of the room. And just note that we will be closing our event space at 8.30 PM. So thank you all. Thank you.